are in a new month, we are in July, and for those of us who have hung out here a few times, um, and for the benefit of all of us who may not know this space real well, all of our words are up on the screens up here. Um, we have some new uh, liturgical language that we're going to be using uh, starting this month, so all of us are going to be figuring this out together. It's a great week to be a guest or a visitor here, because um, we've got new prayers, new confession, all, no, new language that we'll be walking through together. Again, all the words are up on the screens up there. All the words for all the music is up there. If you need the musical notation to follow along, if you enjoy reading that as you sing, those are in the red books in front of you marked Worship on the Binder. A uh, quick note about communion. Again, just to get us all on the same page. Everyone is welcome. Y'all can come up. Um, the, the meal is yours. We do offer gluten-free if you'd like that. If you need that, um, just let us know, and we will gladly offer that for you as well. If you come up here and you do not wish to receive the meal, but you w wish to receive a blessing, you can do that as well. Just come up, um, either cross your arms in front, of, in front of yourself, or just simply let me know you'd like to receive a blessing, and we can do that as well. This meal, again, is for you. The table is for you. Beyond that, I think we can figure everything out as we go along. If you have any questions along the way, we've got greeters in the back who can get you whatever you need. Just feel free at any moment to go back there and check in with them. Grateful for Lisa who will be leading us in music this morning. Friends, let us begin. Friends, will you please rise as you're able. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. We do not believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways in which we live. We turn to our own understandings. We take offense at your teachings. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Blessed. 
church in wine and bread, raised from soil, raised from dead. You are holy, you are wholeness, you are present. Let the cosmos praise you, Lord. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God is good all the time. Then let us pray, God, our home. You offer shelter from the storms that brew around us and space in which to find our rest. As you lead us through our community, give us courage to speak words of hope and strength to shelter any seeking safety and peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James, Joses, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to, him, to them, prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching. He called for the 12 and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no bread, no bags, and no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but not to put on two shirts. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. The Gospel of the Lord. It's Old Home Week in Nazareth, 
And the Nazareth hometowners, they have pulled together quite a celebration this year. They have, they have bounce houses, they have fireworks. They have the local band performing and they've pulled in an out of town band to perform the next night. There's gonna be a beer garden, of course. There's gonna be a car show. There's gonna be all these events. So obviously, Jesus is going to go home which is what Mark tells us. He goes home with his disciples, and he goes, of course, then, as we would all do when we go home on vacation, is to go back to his synagogue. The synagogue where he grew up, right, where he ran up and down the aisles and, and was patted on the head by his mom to be quiet, and, you know, some of the elders would always glance over, give the side eye, but, you know, that just happens. That place, his home, his people, his family, he goes there and he does what Jesus does, Mark tells us. He begins to speak God's word and he's speaking in such a way that the people are astounded, the people are amazed, the people are surprised, their minds are blown. This is not the first time Jesus has preached and teached in a synagogue where people have been amazed. But these are his people, right? So this should work pretty well. And we're in chapter six, so Jesus has already done a few things, words gotten out. But it is also his local synagogue. So as he's preaching and teaching and people are amazed and they're blown away and they're surprised, at the same time, there's going to be that person who's sitting in the back who says, wait a minute, he's the carpenter. To be fair to carpenters and to be fair to stone workers, this is not a compliment. It was actually maybe not one of the most ideal jobs to have in that time, to be towards the bottom of the food chain, if you will, for employment. So this is a little bit of a derision. This is kind of a way, a little bit, to undercut Jesus. But then there's somebody else in the pew back there who says, oh, wait, isn't he Mary's son? Now, I glance around, and many of us have been in small towns for many years in our life. We know how that conversation's gonna go. Inevitably, you're now gonna have the sub-conversation in the back with all the people who are like, well, I went with Mary when she was in elementary school, and boy, she had all these stories. She had such this huge imagination about these fantasy things happening in her life. And you remember Joseph, right? He barely got through high school. Wait, Jesus is part of that group? He's in that family? No way. Mark tells us that this group that was astounded, that was amazed, that was surprised, their minds were blown. Within a few short minutes, they're repulsed by Jesus. These are his people. This is his family. This is his church. These are the people who raised him up. They taught him Hebrew. They taught him about God. They taught him the Ten Commandments. They taught him who Moses was and who King David was and, and who Hagar was and all these wonderful characters from Scripture. These are the same people who are now looking at him. And not only are they just turned off by him, but they are physically moved away from him simply because how they see him. And Jesus, it turns out, Mark tells us, he is appalled, but we could also translate that as amazed, surprised, astounded. His mind is blown. So why does Mark give us a story about Jesus being rejected? Why does Mark give us a story about Jesus failing. He has all this power. He is, of course, God's son, but Mark tells us in this particular moment, he is deemed powerless. Jesus, that guy, the guy we build homes for and we gather around week after week, this guy is now powerless. Why does Mark need to tell us a story about his rejection? Now, in this particular house over the last month, we have not been reading the Gospels at all. We've been hanging out with Paul in the letter to the Philippians, and we haven't read the Gospel of Mark in actually quite a while, so it's a good time for all of us to just kind of get on the same page very quickly. In 6970 CE, the Roman Empire decided that they were going to destroy the temple. They did that strategically because the Roman Empire knew that the temple was a source of power for the Israelites. For for a couple of hundred years already, the Roman Empire had been there oppressing the Israelites as they had been oppressing pretty much everybody else around the Mediterranean. And as we might imagine, people revolt, they push back. It's not like the Israelites or anybody else just take that. 
They don't take the oppression, but they always fight back. They push back. There's all sorts of revolutionary stories that happen. It's no wonder that when Jesus appears, some of his followers want him to be a king. They want him to be a revolutionary. They're hoping he's the one who will lead the people against the Roman Empire, push them back. But about 6970 CE, the Roman Empire has had enough of the Israelites, you know, wanting freedom and wanting liberation and their own voice and their economy and all those silly things. And so the emperor sends a, a group of soldiers in who destroy parts of the city and they destroy the temple because the temple is where the Israelites gain their power. The way that you and I gain power when we gather in spaces like this not just because we are washed in these waters and we are bound to Christ forever, not just because we gather at this meal where we are fed and nourished by Christ, but also because we gain power from each other. We share our faith with each other. When we leave this space, we are encouraged to speak God's word. When we leave this space, we feel like we are not one voice, but one voice of many, speaking of love and mercy and compassion in this world. We in a way, we need each other to build each other up and to strengthen and encourage each other to pray for each other. So the empire destroys the place where the Israelites claim that God dwells in this world. And the Israelites fall into chaos. And Mark, the author, responds by telling a story about Jesus. Every gospel writer describes Jesus a little bit differently. If you hung out in my confirmation class, I would tell you that the Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is described as, in essence, a paramedic, or maybe a, a trauma nurse, or maybe as, a, as an ER doc. You pick the job. But in essence, his responsibility is to respond to crisis. He is moving from moment to moment, from scene to scene, from person to person, bringing forth healing, casting out demons, doing all the things and having incredible success as we would expect. He moves from town to town, village to village. At the end of chapter one, he tells his disciples, we have to keep moving. There are more people in crisis. There are more people who are suffering. There are more people longing for good news that God is at work in this world. We have to keep moving. And so they do. They keep moving. Jesus shows up in synagogues. He preaches and teaches, and people are amazed. They're astounded. They're surprised. Their minds are blown because they haven't heard a word quite like this. They've been stuck with, you know, the local pastor all this time, but now they get to have some real, real sermons. But then we get to chapter 6, and we don't know why it's here, why it's not chapter 5, why it's not chapter 7, whatever. The editors and Mark had to figure that out. But here in chapter 6, Jesus goes home. I mean, when you talk about an easy audience... This should be the one who'd be like spreading butter on warm bread. I mean, these are the people who raised him. These are the people who know him. They know him better than anybody else. And these are the ones who reject him. These are the ones who send him away. They are repulsed by him. So Mark must be telling us something about Jesus. Mark must be telling us something about ourselves. And we know that Jesus comes into this world to be us, not a version of us, not a, not a vision of us, not an apparition of us, not a, a mirror image of us, but Christ comes into this world to become us. You all have been to the Christmas Eve service. You've heard the story, Jesus born in this world. He comes to be you, me, us. Jesus comes into this world because here is where we dwell, here is where we suffer, and here is where we are rejected. At some point in our lives, we have felt turned away. At some point in our lives, we have felt silenced. We have felt like we don't have as much power as someone else. We don't have the voice that someone else has. We don't have the social capital. We don't have the income. We don't have the right job status to be respected and to be revered. We have felt rejected, turned away, passed over, ignored, shunned. Jesus enters into this world to become us. And this happens in his home congregation. And Mark tells us that it is his people who turn him away. So as much as we're reflecting on the brokenness that we endured, Christ is also reminding us of the brokenness that we bring forth into this world, how we daily turn Jesus away, even in houses that we build in his name. At some point today, at some point in our lives, 
the Jesus who we like, the Jesus who we give all the hearts to, we follow on Instagram and Snapchat and all those sorts of things, the, the Jesus who we read about, the Jesus who we adore, the Jesus who we want to hear more from, at some point he's going to say something or do something that's just going to straight up offend us, bother us, and we are going to say we're done. And we will turn the other way. At some point we will find ourselves standing on the perimeter of the kingdom of God. And it's going to feel like Jesus is on the other side, away from us, away from our values, away from our vision of the world, the way we imagine families working in this world, the way governments and communities are meant to function in this world. At some point, Jesus is going to do it, and he will do it again, and we will reject him again, and we will feel repulsed by him again. On every page, practically every sentence in Mark's gospel, we come to discover very quickly, even in this story where he is at home with his people, that the only way that we can fully know grace, the only way that we can fully know God's forgiveness and redemption is through the cross. The cross that we carpenters build for Jesus. And we hand it to him willingly. We, we want him to take it. We want him to go away. Because sometimes the only power that we have over another person is death. So Jesus takes on our suffering. Jesus takes on our brokenness. Jesus takes on our pain, our disappointment, our despair, our rejection, and the rejection that we give to our neighbors and to our coworkers and to our classmates, even to our own family. He takes all of it and destroys it on the cross. And he does this so that you can know, and our neighbors can know, and our classmates can know, and our coworkers can know that you are loved. Absolutely. Unconditionally. You are loved. In this world of brokenness, in this world of despair, in this world of suffering and rejection, God dwells. God comes into this world because this is where we exist. So here is where we need to hear a word of good news. Here is where we need to be reminded again that God will do whatever it takes so that we can know that we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are made whole. He will even go into his hometown, to his own people, his own followers of Christ, who will turn him away and he will receive us and he will love us, he will redeem us, he will wash us in these waters, he will feed us at this table, he will bind us to each other. And as Mark's story goes today, the mission does not stop at the cross. Jesus then sends his disciples out because this world is longing for good news. Our coworkers know what it means to be rejected. Our classmates know what it means to be silenced. We know the depth of our brokenness and our sin in our lives. Our neighbors know the depth of brokenness and sin in their lives. And so we are being sent out with this word of grace two by two back out into the world, facing our rejection, facing the fact that we might be turned away, we might be silenced again, but this time we go with God. Because God needs this good news proclaimed. So Jesus sends you as carpenters, as stone workers, as teachers, as doctors, as nurses, as medics, as truck drivers, as retired people. Jesus sends you because you know the story. You know this grace. You know how far you've gone moving away from Christ and how far Christ will go to claim you, love you, redeem you, and bring you into God's kingdom. So Jesus sends you as a word of grace, as a sign of life, as a proclamation to a world in pain that God is bringing healing and mercy and love. Amen. Friends, will you please rise you're able? We will sing. Bye.
by Christ the Lord of all. A single great commission compels us from above to plan and work together that all may know Christ's love. We all are called for service to witness in God's name. Our ministries are different, our purpose is the same. To touch the surprising grace so every folk and nation may feel God's warm embrace now let us be united and let our song be heard now let us be a vessel for God's redeeming word. We all are one in mission, we all are one in call. Our varied gifts united by Christ the We confess our faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Come again to judge the living and the dead. <clears throat> the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the sin of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One, in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. Glorious God, you find us where we live and dwell among us in mercy. Let the church arise in your teaching, our, prayer, our praying, our healing, and our dwelling with our neighbors. Make your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace. Lord, in your mercy. Life-giving God, your fingers trace the heavens and your hands mold the earth. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. We pray especially for all in the path of Hurricane Barrel, the storms that move across the U.S. and the wildland fires burning out west. Sustain the well-being of every living thing. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, you speak and the nations listen. Open those who govern to the cries of all who have no food or shelter, particularly people fleeing violence, those seeking freedom, and those in search of community. Center the thoughts of our leaders on those who suffer and have no support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your embrace brings wholeness to those who are troubled. Bring healing to all who suffer and struggle in life, including all those we name now aloud or in our hearts. We pray also for Pastor Marsha, Kathy, Eugene, Barb, Jimmy, Cindy, Ethan, Carrie, Hazel, Marsha. We pray for the family of Doug Ween and the family of James Welty. Reveal your presence through the medics, nurses, doctors, and caregivers who respond to our cries. The Lord, in your mercy. Our prayer. Welcoming God, in your presence, strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors. Open our doors to those who have been rejected. 
particularly people who have been silenced or marginalized by church and society. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, you gather us into your house of many dwelling places. We give you thanks for our faithful departed. Inspire us by their lives of faith until with them we rest forever at our journey's end. Lord, in your mercy. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. We close these prayers as together we say, Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Read through the bolts and you can see what's going on in the life of our church. Um, reminder that, that um, towards the end of the month, here in July, we're going to ha- be hosting the, uh, the University of Illinois Extension Office Junior Chef Program. We've been doing this for years and years. We are grateful that they're willing to use our kitchen and our space. They, they usually do it, actually, so it... Only certain kids can come. It seems kind of strange that it would be exclusionary like that, but it's designed specifically for kids who come from lower income backgrounds. Um, And we often have it for two weeks. I'm not sure yet where they're at. They were talking about needing a second week because so many kids sign up for this. So we are looking for a little bit of extra help from all of y'all. So if you're around during the week, you you can read the week right there. You don't have to prep food. You don't have to necessarily run the program in any sort of way. We just need a couple extra humans in the space to help the program run really well. So you're mainly just there, honestly, leaning against the wall, waiting for them to say, hey, could you do the thing real quick? Um, So it's really easy, low-tech work. If you're available that week, we would love to have you. Next Saturday, July 13th, is our VBS, our Noisy Offering Ministry and Focus is for that program. We are in uh, partnership with the Methodist Church and the Brethrens. So please pass this out. It's got a QR code on it. All mom or dad or, or uh, responsible adult has to do is zap that with their phone, couple of pieces of information, and you're in. It's totally free. And our VBS every year is just a huge, it's so much fun. Music and dancing and singing and games on the lawn and Hopefully the weather will hold out so we can do as much of it as possible outside. And it ends with an ice cream social for everybody, not just for the kiddos. It's for everybody. Um, So that's happening next Saturday, July 13th. Again, as you read through here, you can see all the things that are going on, all the things that we're beginning to collect for. Reminder, school is only about a month away. I know. I, especially the teachers are like, oh no. Um. Summer's almost done. Um, But for all of us, that also means school supply sales are going to be going up. And uh, we do collect supplies um, for our local school and for Lutheran World Relief as well. So have that in the back of your mind. Friends, can you please rise? You're able. We'll prepare for communion. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self, and you called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown, <coughs> excuse me, gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread and when he gave thanks he broke it gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me 
After supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Confident our Lord is at work in this meal, we offer the prayer that he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The meal is prepared. Come, taste and see.
Will you please rise, you're able. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Believing in Christ, we are called to grow and sent to serve. Be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit this day and every day, wherever you may go. Amen. The Lord now sends us forth with hands to serve and give to make of all the earth a better place to live. The Lord now sends us forth with hands to serve and give to make of all the earth a better place to live. The angels are not sent into our world of pain to do what we were meant to do in Jesus' name that falls to you and me and all who are made free. Help us, O oh Lord, we pray, to do your will today. The angels are not sent into our world of pain to do what we were meant to do in Jesus' name that falls to you and me and all who are made free. Help us, O oh Lord, we pray, to do your will today. Go in peace, speak Christ's life to all. Thanks be to God.